You could cut the tension with a knife in that courtroom, couldn't you? Now, again, that was outside the presence of the jury. If you're just tuning in, the jury's been sent on their quick morning stretch break. Uh, they're due back in a matter of minutes. Let me bring back in our guest still with me in Denver, Colorado, the former district attorney for the 18th Judicial Circuit in Colorado, George Brockler, and also just joining us this hour, criminal defense attorney and former prosecutor, Eric Faddis, also in Denver, Colorado. And I want to make a connection for our viewers right now because I know they have both enjoyed your analysis, both of you respectively, on different shows at different times here on Court TV. But what they may not know is that when George Brockler was a deputy DA in the office, he hired Eric Faddis to be one of his assistant DAs. And uh, in Eric, you learned under George's direction. It's, it's no wonder you are uh, as outstanding as you are giving analysis. And so, George, great job to you as the mentor and Eric, great job as a mentee. So it's great to get you two Thanks. together for analysis today. Um, OK, so, Eric, since we're just welcoming you, uh, I'm going to start with you. What's your take on the arguments we just heard outside the presence of the jury, please? Yeah, Julie, I mean, a pretty saucy exchange in there, wasn't it? And, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, for the record, I've seen George engage in some saucy exchanges with public <laughs> defenders out here in Colorado. Um, but, yeah, you know, for me, the prosecutor is, is, is sort of presenting these bumbling, convoluted hypotheticals, you know, um, if X and, you know, assume X, Y, and Z, and then, you know, let's pretend this happened, then what would you do? I, I'm not sure how effective it is, nor am I sure how, how appropriate it is in court. It's, it's, it's calling for um, speculation on the defendant's behalf. Um, and I think there have been some improper remarks uh, from the judge in this. You know, the judge is saying the cross-examination was particularly effective. The evidence is grisly. Most of those evidence have been hot or comments have been hostile towards the defense. Right, right. You're so perceptive, Eric. Yes, yes. And I'm so glad you mentioned this, these is hypotheticals as problematic. Um, and George, let me go to you on this one because I've been troubled by this. It started last week. He was giving him hypos and the way I was always taught and, and generally with trial advocacy, it's the expert witnesses who get the hypotheticals, not the lay witnesses. Can you help me make some sense of this, please? Yeah, I wish I could. First off, great to have Eric on here. He's one of the good ones out there. That's why I hired him. And it's good to see that he's uh, successful because he's wearing a pretty sweet suit. Um, <laughs> let, let me say Agreed. this about what's going on in there. Um, I think the judge is wrong, respectfully. I think he's absolutely wrong in the way that these questions are being phrased. And I think what we're seeing from Mr. Lewin, who's incredibly experienced and super well prepared, there's no denying any of that, is that this is the downside of being snuggled up close to the defendant when you do cross-examination, is you lose the ability to get the sense of how this is playing with the jury. You can't see them out of the corner of your eye. You can't turn to them when he answers. And I think for me, it's turned into a giant yawn fest. And I think the objection that the defense is missing here is not whether it's argumentative, it probably is, speculation could be. It's that his opinion, that Durst's opinion about the questions being asked is wholly irrelevant. For example, when um, Lewin says, don't you think it would be fair for a juror to conclude blank based on this? Or isn't it intriguing that blank? In my opinion, the proper objection here is relevance, Judge. What possible relevance could Mr. Durst's opinion about what jurors think, how in the world is that relevant to any fact at issue in this case? I think that Mr. Lewin needs to take a step back. This has become far too personal. It's become far too intense for him. He is so committed to trying to get Durst to admit something or commit to an answer. He'll take a one fact, maybe worth a couple question answer and stretch it out into five minutes through open-ended questions that aren't targeted or leading. And it, for me, he lost my interest. And I'm a guy who's interested in this. I'm talking about it. I lost interest in his cross-examination. Right, right. And I think Robert Durst is starting to sort of maybe feel a bit of annoyance or something today. And I want to ask you this, Eric. I, I, it seemed to me like, like today there's a little bit of a shift with Robert Durst and his mood. I see that he's making more eye contact with John Lewin. Uh, he seems a little bit annoyed. I wonder if, if John Lewin is kind of wearing him down a little bit. And and then I have to think, I mean, I, I would never go about this cross this way. I, I'm sure you uh, exceptional trial attorneys wouldn't either. Um, this is very unusual the way John Lewin is doing this. But do you think this could be his intentional strategy that he's just trying to wear him down to get under his skin so much so that he tries to break him? Eric, your thoughts, please. 
You know, Julie could be, and Robert Durst is a slippery eel, right? He, he's been able to <laughs> slither out of a lot of these questions. Um, but I think, you know, Lewin is keeping the pressure on. He's really trying to back Durst into a corner. And I think at least at some portions of the cross-examination, that has been effective. Yeah, you know, I, I, it's it's something else. It's I mean, this cross is nothing like I've ever seen. Um, you know, you two are both very experienced. Uh, George, have you ever seen anything like this in, in your years uh, serving as, as a DA? No, I think when you engage in cross-examination, especially the defendant, and we had talked about this last week, your goal cannot be a lengthy campaign. It has to be to get in and get out. Otherwise, this ha runs the risk of becoming like a Russia in winter or an Afghanistan, where whatever little victories you sustain, at the end of the day, they're lost to how lengthy the campaign is. This is an old man with a catheter in whom, who very well may have killed three people. Get your points in, score them through leading questions, and get out. But this is becoming a protracted war that I'm not sure what's on the other side. Let me say this, though. If this guy's convicted, and he very well could be, we're all going to look back and say every decision that was made in trial was the right one because it came up with a victory for the for the prosecution. But I think right now, if we're in that truth-telling mode, I really think Lewin needs to take a step back and reevaluate how he's approaching this cross because he may be wearing the guy down, but he's wearing me down too, and he may be wearing the jury down. Mm, excellent points. I'm glad you mentioned that, George, because you're right. Just because there's a result at the end doesn't mean it was reached in the right way or a proper way or the best way. I, I want to play a clip for you, too, because this was, I think, the moment of the day. And I, I want to get your reactions to it. And to kind of set this up, this is the point of the cross-examination where John Lewin is, is talking about Susan having a, quote, unquote, big mouth. And he's saying to Robert Durst, well, this, she's not someone you would want to ever confess anything to because she's known to have a big mouth. And Durst says, well, no, she was more of a storyteller, big mouth, or your words. Uh, so at any rate, it gets to the point where Robert Durst says something kind of off the wall. Let's take a look. So, Mr. Durst, my question is, you heard, for instance, and you referred to it, I think you referred to it in your testimony with Mr. DeGaran, that even Steve Silverman said, and he testified to this, that 